Hey guys, so I've thrown together a quick script to automate installing Arch Linux. Check the link in the description for the script and for instructions on how to set up your own custom ISO. Also, we have pre-built custom ISOs that you can download. Just check the link in the description for those as well. Now in this video, we're gonna show you how the Arch install script works. We're gonna go over the script itself. Then we're gonna show you how to um, actually create your own custom Arch ISO. And then we're gonna show you how, to, how we upload it to Proxmox and install it on a Proxmox VM. And then we're going to show you how to create create a bootable USB drive with this ISO, and we're gonna demo installing Arch on a laptop with this uh, automated script. So this script assumes you have a working network connection, and it will uh, it's basically gonna set it up with DHCP by default, so you're gonna need a network connection with DHCP, and if you don't, you can uh, go ahead and uh, either modify the script or you know before running the installation also um, you know set up with static IP or whatever else also same deal with Wi-Fi before running the installation if you're relying on a Wi-Fi connection set that up before running the script um, I hope to kind of build that into the script later on but right now it doesn't set up Wi-Fi for you so it kind of requires a, a wired connection and it requires DHCP so I'll, I'll try to get that stuff uh, worked out in a future version of the script I'm gonna be updating it a lot but yeah check the link in the description for the script and um, yeah it's the password for root and for the non root user are going to be the same by default so either override that or go ahead and change it after the installation that's that's probably what you should do after it installs on the first time you log in um, just go ahead and change that password. Now, uh, this installer should support both BIOS and UEFI, so the partitioning scheme should support both of those, so you should be able to uh, move this disk between a system that has either BIOS or UEFI, and the, the installation script should work on uh, both, both, uh, both types of systems. Now, swap is by default set to be equal to the amount of RAM on the system, and this is needed needed for hibernation to work. Now, you could either uh, decrease that or increase that if you feel like overriding it up to you and whatever your use case is. Now, the time zone, the locale, and the keyboard layout are hard-coded, so you'll have to override those as needed. All right, so this is the actual code for the script. The script itself is split up into two parts. The first part runs before the uh, before ch rooting, and the second part runs from within the ch root environment. The first script calls the second script, so you don't have to call two scripts. Um, any case, um, let's see right here. So the main idea of this script is to uh, just run with automatic defaults in place, so you don't have to be prompted or, or give it any input or anything. But I am eventually gonna add another option so that you can, it will prompt you for things if you like. But, um, and I'll probably add a GUI and a bunch of other nice features too. But for now, um, I think the default behavior that I'm always gonna want is that by default, it's just gonna install the system without having to ask you anything. And that's gonna be the default behavior. In any case, I, ha I have a nice little uh, to-do list that I put right at the top of the script here. Um, yeah, I got to check for errors and stuff like that. Um, any case, so moving right along here, I try to figure out all of these, uh, all of this information. I either hard code values or I just try to figure it out automatically. Now, if it doesn't work, you'd have to override it. And if you want to have a different, like, let's say you don't feel like changing the password afterwards, maybe you're uh, installing a bunch of systems one after another, and you, you could chain override the password here for example, and then um, just do all your installations, assuming you're like uh, bringing up a bunch of machines that are all gonna have the same password. That's an example use case. Any case, um, yeah, so user, this is the non-root user that it's gonna create for you. Um, this is the password, um, change me. So every time you type that in, it's gonna remind you that you really should be changing it. Now, this is gonna be the, the NIC that it assumes the network is gonna be on and it's going to configure the network for that later on in the script we'll get to that but um, ba basically uh you know we're filtering out wi-fi um, local loopback and, and ver interfaces and um, basically just taking the first one so if you happen to have two physical network interfaces and the wrong one is coming up first then you're gonna to have to override that or something also um, yeah i'm gonna get some wi-fi support in there eventually but for now if you have a wi-fi wi connection you're gonna to have to do that manually outside the script 
Um, it does identify Wi-Fi NICs and prints them out for you later on, just so you know what's on your system, um, just to be kind of helpful and stuff. And then it just checks all, gets a list of all the NICs just to show you what NICs are on your, are on your system. So it'll show you the difference between what's there and what was selected in case you run into issues. Um, so for the disk, it's going to select the first um, SATA or NVMe disk that it finds. If you have multiple disks on your system, there's a good chance you'll have to override that. But default behavior, if I have a simple system, one hard drive, you just want to install Archon, it's going to install it pretty quick. So th this should in this should um, th these are, this would be like the most common use case, and uh, it's, it's supposed to basically just uh, match that. So in any case, swap size, we're basically setting it to match what how much RAM the system has. And the reason for this is, um, you know, it, it's basically for hibernate. You, you need it for hibernate. So you need, even if you have a ton of RAM, maybe you have way more RAM and you don't want to allocate that much space, you might want to override this, or maybe you just want more swap space for whatever reason, same deal. You'll have to override it. But there, the, that's the reason I chose this as a default value. Basically, it checks how much RAM you have and sets the swap size to that. Put some notes in here. It'll echo this out at the beginning just to remind you of all that stuff. Um, it'll remind you, you know, the default non-root user, your default password that you you're, you really should change. And, you know, if there is a Wi-Fi NIC, um, yeah, if there's a Wi-Fi NIC found, it is going to uh, remind you that it's there and that maybe you should uh, configure it before running the installer. In any case, um, yeah, here it just prints out information about your NICs, about your disks, um, shows you more info about your disks with the LSBLK. Um, prints out your swap space you're going to use and say, hey, press any key to continue. I am going to add something ahead so that it only says press any key to continue if you have debug mode enabled. So by default, it'll just run through and not ask you anything, which is great when you just want to install something super quick and you know it's probably going to work. Um, any case, um, disk. So basically just assign the actual device name for a disk because we're going to use that later. And let's see, so that's different from the variable disk one. Disk one is the actual device, so this would be like SDA, whereas uh, disk is going to be dev SDA. Um, any case, here I'm creating an environment file because I found some weird behavior. When I ch root, it, um, what, what happens is the, the script that I launch upon ch rooting, some, some of the, the variables in the script are picked up by it and some are not. I'm not sure why. I'm sure it's something silly that I just over, uh, something that I overlooked. But in any case, some variables were getting picked up and some weren't. It was just some weirdness with the environment. So I wanted to explicitly create um, an environment file. This is just um, generated on the fly within the script just to temporarily hold your environment variables. And these will be sourced when the second script is run. So in any case, all the basic variables that we already defined above just get um, just get appended to this environment.sh. So first we wipe it out, we overwrite it, and then we append to it. And I know you can do this with uh, I, I know you can do this with a you know one cat command just to redirect a whole block of text. But I was having issues with that. With um, I was having issues getting that to work with uh, variables, and um, I didn't want to poke around with it too much, so I, I opted to just run a bunch of echo statements. Um, and actually, yeah, this this won't do anything, but I can actually just remove this. I'm gonna have to add. Yeah, th this is from when I was using the cat command in in one big block, so I I, I really should have deleted this. The script works with this, but this this is an error in my script, so I'm gonna have to delete that and uh, get this script updated. Um, any case, yeah, chmod, you know, basically give everyone execute permission for this uh, environment as sh file. And here, what I'm going to do next thing, I'm just going to calculate the offsets for partitions. So we are creating an ESP partition for system UEFI systems and a BIOS boot per partition for BIOS systems. Because by default, we're just creating a GPT disk layout. Um, so we're, we're just going with that. And um, we're, we're, uh, this script does not give you the option to use master boot record. It's going to be GPT no matter what. Um, so it basically doesn't cater towards dual booting with Windows, but no big deal there. Um, any case, so it's going to be GPT, but if you, you combine GPT and uh, BIOS, you need a BIOS boot 
uh, partition. So we're creating that and we're creating EFI so that this could support both UEFI systems and biospace systems. So it's going to create these partitions on the target disk and that target disk could be moved between something with BIOS and something with UEFI and it should theoretically work just fine. So that would, for example, be great for installing things on a USB drive. So that, that is one use case for that. Although the way I install Grub isn't necessarily great for USB drives. Um, you'd have to modify the command for that for it to really work and create a bootable USB drive. But in any case, um, maybe, maybe an option that I should add on later on. But um, yeah, anyways, it calculates all the offsets. And the reason I have to calculate these offsets, I know there's a tool called GDisks that just creates the next partition and calculates the beginning offset of the partition automatically for you, which is really convenient. But um, apparently the tool to use these days is parted. And I opted to go with that because it, it works great. It's one tool that works. I know you could use FDisk supports both GPT and MBR. But um, Parted is the new modern replacement for all these tools that works with both uh, disk label formats, both MBR and uh, GPT. So in any case, I'm going with Parted. Uh, it's a little bit of a pain to work with. I had to calculate all those offsets. It would be a pain to do this by hand every time. Using a script is the way to go for this for sure, even if you didn't script the, the entire installation. Um, in any case, first thing I do, um, wipe any disk labels. Just to, in case there's anything on the disk, uh, I'm just going to wipe it out so we can start from a clean slate. This doesn't wipe all the data on the disk, just wipes the, the disk labels so you'll start with a clean disk and you can start partitioning it from scratch. Next thing I do, I create a GPT partition label, um, GPT disk label, so right here on our disk, um, yeah, just creating a new label. Um, in any case, then I start partitioning, you know, create that first, uh, that, that first uh, EFI or yeah, ESB partition right here. Um, and then I, I uh, set this uh, to basically setting this flag sets it to sets the type of partition to ESP. And it's kind, kind of strange how instead of selecting partition types with uh, parted, you select flags. Um, just a different way of doing things, I guess. I mean, I'm used to FDisk myself. I've uh, been using FDisk for the last 20 or so years or more. But um, yeah, kind of just getting used to parted myself. So any case, um, yeah, next partition, just create your BIOS boot partition, same deal, set the type to BIOS boot. Then you're gonna quick create the swap partition, set it to, and it is going to be swapped based on just telling it that that's the type apparently. Um, apparently that's how parted works. And then we uh, create the actual Linux root file system. And we can just tell that to go up to 100% here, which is, is nice. At least we can use a percentage there. Anyways, um, then we print out the partition so you can see what partitions the, the tool has, the script has created for you. You know, press any key, press the any key to continue. Uh, kind, kind of like a joke from The, the Simpsons. Uh, any case, formatting file systems. Yeah, I, I just do that in all of my scripts where you need to press a key to continue. I just say press the any key. So you can be like, where is the any key? Uh, any case, formatting file systems, you know, use ext4 for, you could use xfs if you like, or butterfs, btrfs, btreefs, whatever you want to use. But um, in this case, I'm just sticking with the most common thing, ext4. And um, I'm using fat for the EFI partition. So fat32, well, um, we have a dash f32, and that's, uh, that you need that to be a, uh, to match the spec for our EFI partitions, and then doing MK swap to, to create our swap to format our swap partition, and then swap on to start using it. Then we're going to mount our root file system, which is the last one created, so partition four. Then we're going to create a directory within that under boot EFI. We use a dash p to create any parent directories automatically, and we then mount the EFI partition right here. And then uh, after that, we are going to run packstrap. So we're running packstrap k mnt base. And this, and then we say Linux, Linux firmware. Now, what this is doing is this is just installing your base, uh, your, everything you would need to get a basic uh, Arch system up and running, all the basic core stuff for the system. Now, you notice there's Linux and Linux firmware. And if you're running in a VM, there's a good chance you might not need Linux firmware. I'm not. I haven't tested that to see exactly which cases you do and don't need it, but you probably don't need it on a VM. If you're running a container, then both the, the uh, kernel and the firmware are optional. Um, I have not tested that. I have not built Arch in a container yet, so I have not tested that. But apparently you, you could potentially 
leave those out. Any case, this is how I automate this step. So we're going to say generating file system table. We we uh, basically just gen, run gen FS tab, echo it over the, the file system, uh, over your FS tab file right here, um, which is on this mounted directory right here. So in any case, moving light right along, press the any key, it echoes out some info. So I actually wanted to, this is for debug purposes, I wanted to echo out these variables before entering the ch root environment, and I do it again after entering the ch root environment. Now, right here, we are going to, uh, we're going to copy the script, our fast install stage two script. This is the second part of the script. We copy it over to the root file system on the target disk, and which is mounted on MNT. And then we will um, copy that environment file that we generated over there as well. And then we run arch ch root and tell it MNT. So this is gonna be our new root directory. And then we can pass a script that we want it to execute. And that's our second script. So this is the stage two of our script. It's going to run fast install stage two. Now we're going to, I'm going to show you that script in just a second, but that script is going to run here. And when that script returns, it's going to execution is going to return back to this script that we're in here. And then it's going to run a little bit more stuff. It's going to say one last link, and it's going to create this, this link for resolve.conf, setting up resolve.conf to use systemd resolve D, um, which I apparently can't do in a ch root environment so i had to do but it does work from the install disk outside of the ch root environment thankfully i was able to still set that up otherwise i'd have to leave some of the network configuration stuff until after installing the system i mean i could have also just overwritten the resolve.com file and just kept it simple but any case um i wanted dhcp to uh work and i'm using system d network D for DHCP, and um, I wanted that to all just pull in um, DNS info from DHCP too, so I had to get Resolve D working with that. So for, for those reasons, I needed to stick with that. So I'm running this step here after the second script. Once that's done, it says, you know, all set, press any key to reboot, and after you press any key, it's going to reboot, and then it should boot up into your installed system. You know, while it's rebooting, you know, once it comes down, you want to pull out your install media, uh, it, there's a good chance it might do that for you, or you might not need to do that if, um, you, you, you know, if your system is set to boot off of the hard drive by default, then once there's an OS on the hard drive, it'll boot, boot by that by default and not to your, your uh, install media, if your system's configured that way. In any case, this is the part where it reboots. So that's the first script. Let's jump into the second script here. So that was fast install dot sh. Now let's look at fast install stage two dot sh. So let's click on this. Now scroll on down here. We see echo inside ch root environment um, source our that environment script that we created. This will make sure we have all our environment variables that we we wanted or all the variables that we defined in the previous script, all those values we calculated and the hard coded values like the password and stuff. So in any case, then we just echo out a few of them just to verify, make sure everything's working. That, that's just for de debug purposes. And then we install some important packages. Now, some of these are absolutely critical and some of them are just really nice to have, just things that I feel like you should have on most systems. Some of them you need for the system to boot and some of them I just think every system should have. So you might want to tweak this if you choose, but um, I would recommend just leaving it as is. So yeah, a bunch of things here like, you know, man page. Oh, and note that there's a no confirm here. So you're not going to have to confirm any of these. That's that's good for working in a scripted environment. So in any case, man pages, DNS utils, you know, for things like host and NS lookup, ETH tool, you know, a bunch of networking tools that you're, you're going to want. Um, just to troubleshoot the network or do anything with the network. You should just have that. You should always have wget, OpenSSH, um, USB to utils, USB mode switch, TCP dump, smart mod utils, GNU, Netcat, um, MC, DOS tools, FAT utils, you know, in case you put a USB drive in your system. It's just, you know, it's it's frustrating to not have that already there. And, and then the, the first time you go to install one, you're like, oh, I don't even have the package. I have to install it. So it's good to just include that. NTFS 3G, there's a good chance if you don't mount Windows disks, you might never need this. So I just put it in there. I feel like it's something every system should have, but you could exclude that if you like. There's part clone, parted, part image, um, GPTF disk stuff that are 
things that are just nice to have utilities for working with disks and it's, you know so you can administer your system if, if something comes up and we have some some Wi-Fi tools, IW and WPA supplicant. Now, if you're on a VM or a server or something, these are probably useless and maybe so on a desktop too. On a laptop, they're probably critical. So um, you can, I, I always just install them no matter what though. You can install Dialog, Bastevel if you want to be able to compile things. Vim, if you like Vim, you really should just have it on there, like it or not. Um, and we also install Grub, pretty important if you want to be able to boot your system, assuming you're using Grub. OS Prober, EFI VARs. So if you're on an EFI system, you pretty much need all of these. And OS Prober is needed to automatically detect other operating systems that could be installed in any of your hard drives. So it's a convenient thing to have. Then there's Intel microcode and AMD microcode. Now, if you're only on an Intel system, you only need Intel only. If you're on an AMD system, you'll need AMD. If you want to move your hard drive between two systems, you might want to have both. I'm not 100% sure that Either of these are absolutely required, but they're just good to have and they're highly recommended. So any case, um, we're going to, uh, after doing that, I would recommend, uh, so the script will basically, you know, CD into uh, the bin USR bin directory and create a link from Vim to VI so that you can just type VI and you're, you're going to be using Vim uh, because, um, you know, I, basically for me, I, I, I've been using it since way back when pe people used to just call it VI and a, a lot of systems where that actually has a VI and not Vim installed. So just out of habit, I type like to type VI rather than Vim. Um, so up, up to you, but I, I included that in the script. So set mouse equals V that will disable a really annoying um, visual mode that pops up in VI anytime you right click with the mouse. That is uh, really frustrating. So I, I got rid of that and um, I put that in the vimrc file so yeah so for, for the root user anyway you probably want to do that with the non root user so yes yeah, just set that as a default setting and let's see so linking so we, we link our our uh, time zone and uh, set the run, run this hardware clock command we uh, echo a uh, we're echoing the locale here and running to set the locale running locale gen to generate it and uh, throwing this uh, throwing this lang var var variable right in here, and basically, if you want a different locale, you pretty much have to override these in the script. I, I may have a once I come up with like a really so more sophisticated GUI or something, I'll make a drop down list or something. But for now, the way the script is intended to be used, if you want to override it, you're going to have to override it here. It, it's not like an option for the script or anything. So, in any case. Um, network setup so echo a host name into your etsy host name file and you know if you all right here's a little note i left here in the script just just so i would remember and same deal here this could be just one big block of code but for now i'm just echoing it over one line at a time this is creating a network configuration file for system d so for system d network d so it's going to match a network device name. This is why at the very beginning we uh, calculated our network device because we're going to create a, a configuration for that network device and we're going to tell it to use DHCP for IPv4. Now I believe if you just say, instead of saying DHCP equals IPv4, if you just say yes, it's going to configure it for IPv4 and IPv6. Whereas if you say IPv4, it's only going to configure it for IPv4. So I believe that's how that's supposed to work. I haven't played around with it much. So anyways, DHCP version six, you have to say use domains equals true. And um, after you know poking around with this a while, apparently I have to specify that in order to get, um, you know, in order for DHCP to supply um, information about which name servers to use. So rather than taking the default name servers, it will pull them in to, uh, it will pull them in from what your uh, DHCP server uh, provides you. Now you you might not want to if you if you just want to hard code your DHCP server, you rather your DNS servers and not take what DHCP gives you. You can just put in like your you know a public uh, domain server like Google's eight point eight point eight point eight something like that. You can just override that in your uh, Etsy resolve.com file. Just make sure it's not a link file and don't link it at the end of the other script that we showed you in that section that we showed you before. So you could modify this if you wanted to, but that's, this is what I'm going with. So by default, it's just going to take your D DNS server from 
your DHCP info. So we're relying all on DHCP. Then we um, enable systemd network D and enable systemd resolve D. And we are going to, after this, we're going to add a user, a, a non-root user, um, add it to the wheel group. Um, this doesn't give it sudo access by default. I haven't added that to the script. Probably something I should have. It's, it's just some default behavior, the way systems should work and everything. But in any case, uh, so this allows me to set the password for the root user, and this sets the password for the non-root user. Um, so we're using that, whoops, we are using that password variable. And um, yeah, so this is, and that was hard-coded at the beginning of the script. So, you, you know, it's not super secure, but it's just the password change me and it's meant to be changed. So it's not, you know, don't obviously don't keep this password. But in any case, we just use the yes command because it will ask you for, to type your password twice. So yes, we'll just keep outputting the same string over and over until it's uh, killed. So when you pipe it into password, it basically gives it the password twice, which is exactly what you want. So that, that was uh, one recommended way to do that. Um, I saw someone else had done this in their script, so I kind of just copied their methodology there. So installing grub, we are going to create a grub directory. So just mkdir boot grub, and then we're going to run grub mkconfig-o and just specify your grub config file. Then you're going to run grub install and specify the disk. That's, this actually installs the bootloader. It's probably going to grow, go on your... Um, it, I this may or may not work. I haven't tested with this with uh, with a BIOS system, so but um, this should go to your EFI directory. I, I'd actually be curious to see how this works on a, a BIOS based system. Any case, um, I, I should test that out. I haven't tested the script on a BIOS based system yet, so that's kind of an important thing to have working. But um, yeah, any case, this basically installs your bootloader, which um, at least in the case of a UEFI system, it's going to go under your EFI uh, partition. So any case, after that, enable NTP. So um, I'm enabling systemd times syncd. It was one of the most simple options for NTP. And I just wanted to enable that just so you can, you know, get your time updated from, from a centralized online source and always have up to date time. It's kind of just an important thing to have. So I put that there. Um, so after this, you know, press any key and exit the ch root environment. After this, it will bring you back to the first script, which, which you know, then, uh, you know, we, we've already looked at that, but basically that script finishes and it brings you back to this script. So you exit the ch root environment, create that link for your resolve, your resolve.conf file, and, um, and then basically just reboot the system. Now, if you didn't want to use systemd resolve d, for this, um, you might uh, remove this from the script and just you know create something that echoes over your resolve.conf file. Up to you how you want to handle that, but this is how I'm doing it. This in the script. All right, so we're going to actually create a custom Arch ISO now. So first, we're going to use Pacman to install the Arch ISO tool. I'm going to say yes to this. All right, sped that install up a little bit, and now we're going to paste this in here. So this copies uh, an existing profile over to a new directory called Arch Live. This is the directory we're gonna build our system in. See in here, it has, um, so it's basically like a template that we copied over. You can see under AI rootfs, that is the root file system for what's going to become our ISO image. And uh, we, we can take a look in here at the root directory or, or at the roots home directory under the root directory. And um, so that, that's where we're gonna place our script file. So we're gonna check here under home user one. This is where I am keeping my the, the two scripts that I use to uh, automate installation, the two that we just looked at in the previous section. So I'm gonna copy those scripts over, preserving the permissions. Now one thing I got wrong here is the permissions apparently weren't preserved. So I'm gonna to have to go back and fix this the next time I, I build an ISO image. But um, I, I used a dash P to preserve permissions. Apparently it didn't work because they didn't have executable permissions when I booted off of this. Uh, and I should have verified that. But um, when, when I booted off the ISO image, these two scripts were not executable. All right, so from here we run mkarch iso and pass the directory that we created our image in. And it runs the installer. I sped this up by about 8,000%. So it takes a while to do that. But uh, in any case, there we go. It is, it's now done.
and we're going to just check the out directory. That's the default location it places the ISO in. And now we're going to CD into that directory and we're going to rename it. So you, you could keep the name if you like, but um, yeah, th this is based on the, the version of Arch that we built it off of. So just the dated release or whatever. So I'm just renaming this just so I know it's my custom build. And I'm going to try to put a link to where you can download that ISO image yourself if you just want to use my ISO image. Or you could follow these instructions to build your own ISO image. So now we are going to be writing this ISO image to a USB installer. And we're going to use that later on to, <clears throat> we are going to install this on a laptop later on in this demo. But um, we're, going to, we're going to use the ISO image. We're going to upload that to Proxmox to build a VM. But we're going to use this uh, USB installer. We're going to use this to uh, install on a laptop after we build, install on a VM. So keep watching for that. So that's it. Our uh, USB installer is created. Now, you don't really need to run sync, but I kind of like to just do that anyways. All right, so here is Proxmox. This is, uh, so we're going to upload. We're going to first upload our ISO, our custom ISO file. So go to select files, and you see here um, it is not showing up. So I'm going to go ahead and check. I, I actually put it over here on my desktop and upload it and i sped this part up about 800 percent so it's going a little bit quicker than it normally would and almost there and there we are so just basically finished here and we are going to uh it's just still running something and almost there there we go task okay and that is about it that's done so now we're, we uh, have a, a cutaway to another scene here where I've created the VM and now I'm going to select the, uh, I'm going to select the custom ISO that we created here. I'm going to hit OK. And we're going to start up this VM. And there we go. Open up a console. So boot up with Arch Linux. And I sped that that part up too. So now we here we are booted into an Arch uh, install image, and uh, there we go. There are our two scripts that we placed in there in Roots home directory. So I ch mod them because I kind of messed up the permissions on those. And I'm going to run fast install sh. There we go. It it uh, basically tells me what it's going to do. Gives you know gives me all those notes that you're supposed to kind of uh, that it, that people using the script should kind of be aware of. And uh, you know, it tells you what password it's going to use, what what interfaces it identified, and what what disks it identified, the swap size, all that sort of stuff. So we're going to continue on and partition the disks. So we see here it does that pretty quickly, all the partitions we expect. So we're going to move along from that and format the file systems. It goes pretty quick, and then we are going to do our basically pack strap, and we're installing all the initial packages and and uh, you know setting up the initial environment and everything here so I am fast forwarding this a lot so there we go installed that part um, ch rooted all the environment variables look correct here so we're gonna hit that next key and install all the packages that we wanted and there's our script installing the packages fast forwarded that part and now we're going to let it um, set up uh, the network and all, all the other stuff it has to set up here. So it creates the user successfully. It's installing Grub now. And we're going to fast forward through that part a little bit. So this part actually took a little bit. And there we go. Exited the CH root. Now we're going to hit enter. And, and uh, there we go. Rebooted the system. I sped that up a lot. Like um, that, that was that reboot was sped up many times and now we're logging into our newly created system. And there we go. Logged into our, our newly installed Arch VM. And just going to run uname real quick. And now we are going to cut away to our laptop install. So here we have our USB drive and our network cable, our wired internet connection. 
in place and we are booted into the Arch installer. So um, please excuse the the focus here. My camera is just uh, through some parts of this part of the video. My camera keeps trying to refocus and, and it is not working out very well. It's a little bit messed up. I, um, I'm not sure what I did wrong with the settings on the camera, but any case, here we see uh, our our, uh, our script and we're ch modding it just like we did on the VM. Um, I'll have to get that fixed at some point. But in any case, basically just uh, boot up into the installer, ch mod those scripts, which you shouldn't have to do once I fix this. But basically just run the script and you know, you hit enter, enter, enter to continue. See, it's telling us it has Wi-Fi found, but it's using the wired Ethernet connection. It's going to use the one hard drive on this laptop, and it's showing us the, the swap size it's going to do. And there we go. Partition the disks on our laptop pretty quickly there. Formatting the file system. It's basically going to go through the same process. This installs pretty quick. It's like a, this actually turns out to be a really, uh, really convenient, quick way to just quickly get Arch installed onto a laptop. So uh, I was actually pretty happy with how this went. And once again, I'm speeding this part up only 2000%. And this next part, I'm gonna enter CH root environment, just check the variables. I could just cut it, cut out the part where you have to hit the button to continue. But uh, in any case, sped this part up 800%. And now it's going to get yeah, create a user, do that all, all that other stuff, the network configuration and everything else and hit any key to continue and one last link and there we go rebooting i sped this part up 400 percent so you know going through the boot process pretty quick here and there we go there's our laptop and it is now i think it has i think the camera's trying to automatically focus on my fingers as i type or something i did something wrong with this but i, I definitely wasn't going to re-record this part of the video um maybe i should have but any case so becoming root here because sudo is not set up on this system which is fine for being that it's a single user system and everything but um yeah and this keyboard's a little bit awkward so i i have like a mini tripod set up between me and the laptop so i'm kind of trying to reach around it and, and meanwhile the, the camera's going in and out of focus and stuff so it's it's a bit of an awkward situation that i'm kind of recording this from but uh any case yeah, there's our uh, newly installed system. Just ran uname on that. I'm going to actually install NeoFetch. So I'm going to run pacmat, pacman-s. And yeah, the, the other thing that's messed up about this particular laptop, this is an old laptop I bought for experimental purposes. I picked it up off eBay. So there we go. NeoFetch is installed. So the space bar on this laptop is a little bit messed up. Um, but any case, so clear the screen, run NeoFetch again, and there we go. There's our installed Arch system with uh, NeoFetch running. So hopefully you found this useful, or at the very least interesting, and you should definitely give me a thumbs up. But also, if you have your own experience trying to automate installing Arch Linux, leave a comment down below. Or if you have any suggestions, or if you spotted anything I did wrong, or anything that I could improve, definitely leave a comment down below. We want to we want to hear what you have to say, and we are interested to hear everybody's suggestions. And definitely uh, stay tuned for, because we have uh, a lot of improvements to this script coming along, and we have a lot of other great content we're going to be putting out. Um, definitely remember to check the links in the description and uh, you're going to want to hit that subscribe button because you don't want to miss out on the other great content we have coming out. We have a lot of Arch related content, a lot of Gentoo related content, a lot of Linux stuff in general, but we also do Mac OS and Windows related stuff. We do a lot of coding, electronics, Raspberry Pis, servers, 3D printing, networking, all sorts of great stuff you're not going to want to miss out on. So if you want your YouTube feed to, uh, if you just want to have a better YouTube feed, you're going to want to make sure you're subscribe to this channel and you're not going to want to miss out so hit the little bell icon otherwise youtube won't let you know when we come out with new videos so yeah hit hit the subscribe button hit the bell icon and uh yeah stay tuned for all the great stuff we have coming out uh you don't want to miss out and uh as always thanks for watching and we'll see you guys on that next video